Good afternoon and good evening for another very special edition of Wow's Alive with my co-host Quinn Fitzgerald and a special guest Chris Ritter. Welcome, gentlemen. Great to be Welcome. here, Stephen. Yeah. So, Quinn, it looks like you're at the mount uh, at the foot of Mount Fuji. I'm just I'm just crossing my fingers, hoping to be able to go to Tokyo this summer. Got it. Got it. And Chris, where are you located? I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and spring is in full bloom, means the pollen is out, but also the warm weather is out as well. Got it, got it. And Chris, you're known as the man in dryland training in swimming circles. I mean, you know, you've really, really pushed the bar in, in education at a very fundamental level to a very sophisticated level. But, you know, explain what you do and, and what your vision and, and mission is. I appreciate that, Stephen, especially coming from someone like you that's been in the aquatics world for so long. I think back to when I first got into coaching, if you go on, you know, the, the team's websites, you would almost never see anybody dedicated to dry land. And now I feel it's almost shifted the opposite where it's almost unusual if a team doesn't have in their bio some coach that designated towards dry land or has some credentials. So I feel, you know, good that that has changed and we are understanding more that to be a better swimmer, you need to be a better athlete and you're going to enjoy swimming more as well. So that first started for me as a swimmer trying to figure out, well, how do I get better? And then as a coach, how do I get my swimmers better? Whether they're sprinters, distance, it doesn't matter. Everybody can benefit from dryland, and especially you know, with the Wowza audience here, you're you're not looking at walls very often. You're out there in the ocean and lakes, and and I honestly feel distant swimmers. The longer the race is, the more impactful dryland can be. And I think that's kind of counterintuitive from what a lot of people would think. They think it's you know the drop dead fifty guys that really need the weights. And I would actually argue the opposite if you're going to make me pick. And so that led into me moving out here to Charlotte, uh, working with the first iteration of Team Elite and the athletes that David Marsh led into the 2008 Beijing Olympics. So I did their strength training program for that. After that, worked at the club level with 800 plus kids, multiple sites, and I was in charge of putting together the dryland curriculum for how do we take kids from eight years old all the way up to 18, preparing them to swim in college and beyond. And that started uh, some relationships with master swimmers in particular in the local Charlotte area. And some of them traveled a lot. They ran businesses in multiple places and they would work out with me. They would love the workouts. They would feel themselves getting better in the water. But they're like, Chris, I'm, I'm traveling a lot. Like I can't see you all the time. And you got to remember, this is still late 2000s. The iPhone was still fairly new. Apps were still fairly new. And even back then, we figured out how to successfully do online remote training. And we've been doing it now for over a decade, which is even crazy to think about. And then in the last year with COVID hitting everybody in different ways, we just saw the need, especially for coaches to be more educated and understand how can we supplement athletes. You know, almost a year ago, I was saying, hey, we don't know how long this is going to last. Hopefully it's shorter than later, but don't sleep on how much you can gain on land, even if you don't have water time. And a lot of teams and coaches took that to heart and we're seeing them have lifetime bests with not a lot of water time, but doing the right things on land. And, and that turned into the surge strength dryland certification. So that's kind of the newest thing we've been working on. Got it. Got it. And, and to set the record straight, what does dry land mean? When mm. somebody says dry land, I mean, some people have some images of, of you know, doing pull-ups or push-ups. Others have images of resistance bands. Some people have images of, you know, bench press and dumbbells. So what is it? Steven, I love it. You are like literally going through the course. That's the first lesson that we talk about, dry land certification, because I think people don't term it the correct way. And honestly, when I first got into this as a swim coach and strength coach, the more I learned about strength and conditioning and then would see in swimming what people would term dry land, I almost refused to use the term because I didn't think it was appropriate. And now I've kind of come back full circle and say, okay, if people are going to use the term, let's think about it in the correct way. So I think of dry land as a big umbrella term that is basically any training you are doing outside of the water. That's going to look a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And depending on where you're doing it with your water session, where are you in season? So it's just anything that you're doing on land. It doesn't mean there are weights involved or there aren't, or there's certain pieces of equipment. It's just any training that's done on land 
with the intention to get you better in the water. And I think that's the other thing people don't always connect necessarily is, are you doing something on land to make you better in the water? Or are you just making yourself tired or sore or possibly injured? Yeah. Ah, very good. Thank you. And then also when I think of a competitive swimmer or an open water swimmer, that's going to attempt a channel or maybe do a summer coastal swim in my mind, I think of, okay, there's an off season, maybe you're on vacation, maybe then you get back into it. And now you're in the preseason and then you start training harder and harder. You're in mid season, that really lengthy period of time when you're really putting in the yards and then you got a taper period. So in my mind, I, I got, you know, off season, preseason, mid season and championship season or in the open water swimming world, maybe, you know, the two or three weeks before your channel swim or a, a FINA event, et cetera. When you use the umbrella term, um, dry land, does that change during the year? You know, the exercise, repetitions, weight, resistance? Yeah, great question, Stephen. And the short answer is it does. And I love that you even say there is an off season, then there's a preseason. Like, I think that's what the competitive world of swimming has kind of lost. There, there is no off season anymore, it feels like. And so I appreciate that, that you're already thinking about it that way. And it reminds me of a lot of triathletes I work with too, where they think of it very similarly. They have their big one or two races at the end of the season. And then there's time where they're definitely not training, right? They're not on the bike. They're not in the water. They're not running. And again, this may be counterintuitive, but when you're not doing a lot of stuff in the water, or if you're a triathlete doing it among your three disciplines, that's actually the best time to be hitting dry land hard, specifically some type of resistance training, because there's going to be less of carryover effect that's going to diminish your training. Whereas the closer than you're getting to that big meat, I want to dial back the intensity that we're doing on land and the volume as well. So that the focus can be getting better in the water. Cause I'm not trying to turn people into Olympic weightlifters. I'm trying to help you swim faster in the water. So there definitely needs to be an ebb and flow and a complementary approach to what we're doing on land versus what we're doing on water. So the less you're doing in the water, the, the least intense time of the year, you know, preseason, off season, that's the time you need to be going hard on land. And that's going to allow you opportunities to feel different, to have bigger movements, you know, better catch when you get in the water. And then we start to have, you know, a taper down effect as you ramp up your intensity in the water. Got it. Got it. And then what about, um, you mentioned um, when you were a swim coach focused on uh, strength training or dry land training, you know, there's age group kids, eight years old, 10 years old, 12 years old. And then you have your high schoolers, uh, you know, up to 17, 18 year olds. And you have your collegiates, you know, up to 21, 22. Then you have your competitive, you know, master swimmers who, you know, that age group is getting longer and longer. And then you have your open water swimmers who, you know, their careers aren't, you know, four years of high school, four years of college. They're talking four decades and beyond. So when you're doing tri land in your course and in, in, in your vision, do you see different exercises, different movements, different philosophies from that eight year old to that 80 year old? Yeah. So there are times where different exercises are the way to go, but it's not just for the sake of being different. So I want to clarify that. And then the other thing that's important to understand is kids aren't little adults, so you shouldn't treat them that way. And we talk about when's the time to actually add in resistance and strength training. So I'll start at the younger age and then kind of work my way through. So for the younger guys, we have two simple questions that a coach needs to be able to answer affirmatively or yes to if their kids are ready for strength training. And that's, are the kids excited about it? Like, are they going to engage with it? Number one. And number two, are they going to listen and follow instructions? If you can't answer yes to both those questions as a coach, and obviously that's going to pen for different kids, different types of group, don't do it. You're just setting yourself up for failure. And I would rather you work on, you know, crawling, jumping, skipping, hopping for another year or two until the kids are like, yeah, I, I want to lift a little bit. I, I want to take instruction. And so that's this, the simple way coaches need to think through. When do we start adding these other things? Now, on a whole, when I look at an athlete, let's kind of take, you know, the 12 and unders out of it for now. So now we're kind of looking at, uh, you know, pubescent, post pubescent, and then all the way up to, you know, we've worked with athletes in their eighties and nineties. Then it comes down to how well do you move and how strong are you? 
And we use specific assessments and testing to figure that out. And at that point, you can almost slot in what exercises are appropriate. And then going even more into the programming, do you have background in strength training? Yes or no. If you do, how consistent has it been? If it's been, I would say six plus months, then, okay, we're going to program a little bit more advanced. We're going to be changing things up a little bit more because you have a bigger background. You can think about it very similar to a yardage background, right? So if a swimmer is coming from a big yardage background, they're going to be more able to handle bigger volume. Whereas if they have no background, no competitive swimming experience, you're going to take it a lot slower. It's the same approach in terms of strength training. And so once we, you know, are not dealing with kids per se, and it's more teenagers and adults, it really comes down to how well do you move? How strong are you based on our assessments and testing? And then we can slot in appropriate exercises because that's where really most injuries happen is you're not doing an appropriate exercise for your current ability. That doesn't mean it's a bad exercise. It means your programming is incorrect based on where your current reality is. Got it. Got it. That I I love that, that, that age differential. What about gender differential? You know, show a guy in a weight room after training line training, he's showing his biceps, you know, rarely, very rarely do I ever see a female do that. So (laughs) obviously male and female anatomy is different, um, proportionally size, et cetera. Uh, Do you have any specific differences based on gender? Yeah. Going back to programming overall, not necessarily, but two big, extremely generic views that I have is with males, they are going to benefit most of the time with a little bit more mobility work and flexibility work because typically they're going to be a little naturally stronger, a little bit quicker to increase strength, but they're going to be stiff as a board. They're not going to be able to touch their toes. They're not going to be able to get in a good catch position. So if we go back to what's our main goal, it's not to become Olympic weightlifters. It's not to get huge biceps. My goal is to help you be faster in the water. So for males, generally, that means a little bit more emphasis on mobility, flexibility training. Females, kind of the opposite. They most often have pretty good movement. You ask most females to touch their toes. It's not an issue, right? Whereas the guys are over there groaning and and pulling something as they do it. So the opposite, I would have a little bit more focus on strength. And so that would come down to when we look at programming, maybe guys that are really stiff, they're going to have a little bit longer warm up. They're going to have a little bit more ramp up time just to make sure everything's moving. Because at the end of the day, if I'm sacrificing one or two sets, you know, bench press, pull up squats, what have you for some shoulder mobility drills that are going to help them have a more effective catch and easier recovery, that goes back to our main goal of them getting faster in the water. Same token for females. I'm not as worried off the bat in terms of their mobility, as long as their assessments and testings are are pretty good, then it's more an emphasis on, all right, let's make sure we're doing pull-ups instead of maybe three times a week. Can you do five or six? Because it's just about consistency. Even if you're doing one or two sets, that's going to start to add up. Got it. Got it. And, you know, in your course and and everything that you've laid out uh, during COVID and, and prior to that, are you, cause when I'm listening to you, it's like, man, this makes perfect sense. Now, if I'm taking your course, do you, do you make the same approach? Do you actually explain the whys and the how before you actually set off and say, you know, do X, Y, Z? Yeah. And I got one of the best compliments I think we've had, Stephen, that kind of epitomized this. So one coach in particular, uh, Ann Burke, she works with age groupers in the Texas area. And she actually has her master's in education as a teacher. And we were interviewing her on the Surge Strength podcast. She had gone through the certification, got her SSDC credentials. She's able to put that behind her name and know that she has confidence in the knowledge about dryland. And she said, Chris, I've been in education all my life. This is the best laid out course in terms of just how we structured it. And so it's eight modules. The first one is all about dryland overview. So Stephen, very similar to like how you started off this conversation. Why are we doing this? How do we term dryland? What's dryland? How has it evolved throughout the decades? And then why I wanted to do it specifically that way too, because I think a lot of swim coaches, that's not, you know, it's old news. The, the first module is going to be a little bit slow, but a dual purpose of the course is to also help strength coaches, PTs, other people that work with swimmers gain a little bit more knowledge about what actually swimmers do on a daily basis. Whereas then on the flip side, 
when those strength coaches or PTs get to the periodization part, they're probably not going to learn that much new, but swim coaches who don't have a lot of experience in putting dry land programs together, or we get to the exercise and they don't know how to categorize exercises, that's going to be new information as well. So yes, we start off with an overview. Then we move into how do we categorize movements and exercises? Because you could go on YouTube and Instagram and suddenly have a million options, but what do you do with that? It does you no good to have a handful of exercises if you don't know how to properly program it. Why do you put it in this order? Then that leads into the periodization part and the principles that are tried and true in strength and conditioning that have not changed in 50, 100 years. And they're not going to change. It's how do you apply it to the specific athletes in front of you? So that's the first half of the course, modules one through four. And we term that the foundations. The second part is the application. Now we're actually doing something. So we go through the assessments and the testing that we do online and that we encourage coaches to do with their athletes as well. Then it actually gets into how do you create a dry land program? And we actually have a checklist that you go through to create your season plan and your weekly plan, which almost no one thinks about. And then the daily plan. And the weekly plan is what connects the season, the big picture with the daily, the micro. And so if you don't have the weekly plan, that's where things really get lost. And Stephen, as you were talking earlier about how does it change throughout the season? That's the big connection is having that weekly plan to help you adjust as you go through the season. And then module seven, it's all about training specificity. So age differences, stroke differences, event differences, all of that stuff we get into because most people want to jump to that. They feel like that's the, the secret, the magic key. And that's really more the icing on the cake. That's the decoration. You know, I got to teach you to make sure you have something of substance before we get to those things that people feel like is the end all be all when it's really the end product, the, the finishing touches of it. And then the last module is all about equipment. Because Stephen, I've talked to a lot of coaches and athletes, and they feel just as lost, if not more so, about equipment than they do about exercises. What do I get? Where do I get it? Okay, I have $50. I have $100. I have $1,000. Where do I best spend that money on equipment? So we take the whole last module to talk about that specifically. And then at the end, I feel you have a good picture of dryland about the why, the how, and then actually applying it. And throughout the course, we have dozens of case studies, examples, templates. We basically give you everything that we use on the regular basis of the last 10 years to get uh, results with teams and swimmers worldwide. Yeah, oh man, that answer just led like 10, 20 questions alone. Go uh, for it. I, and I won't remember them all, but this is great. This is a you know, for our, our listeners and the people in open water swimmer, all this is really just an introduction. I mean, it's sort of like Chris is an onion and we're just peeling off the first layer. Uh, the first question is, now that you explain all this, you know, very briefly, very broadly, it makes total sense. But how did you, I mean, you were dealing in 2008 with David Mars, Team Elite, Cullen Jones. I mean, you're talking the cream of the crop. It isn't like you just came off the street and said, hey, Dave, you know, I'm really good. I know my stuff and, and you know, I can teach your athletes how to win gold medals. I mean, maybe you did, but can you- I was pretty close to that one, Steve. <laughs> really? Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, so a little so, introduction, how you created this Yeah. So in, in my swimming career, specifically in high school, I had a really bad shoulder injury that almost took me out of my entire senior year. Um, and as a distance swimmer, you'll, you'll appreciate this, not swimming. It's not going to help you in the 500. Right. <laughs> and so even if you could kick a little bit, uh, and even that was limited because the, the shoulders were just so jacked up. And it was because of a combination of, I did a poorly planned dry land program, poor supervision, and then me, myself, very driven individual, I'll just push through this pain. Well, I'll just push through, you know, that popping or whatever. And so all these things combine into really just ruining my senior season. And so then I swam a few years in college, but I knew I wanted to coach. So I actually, after two years, uh, Bob Steele was my collegiate coach. I decided to get in and Bob retired at that point too. So I figured it was a good timing to get into coaching and personal training while I was still getting my degree. So by the time I graduated, I had been personal training for two and a half plus years and had worked my way up in this company to where I was in charge of hiring, firing personal trainers 
and education for 20 plus personal trainers in this company, all before I even got my degree. So it, it really fast tracked me in terms of the experience that I got, seeing a lot of things very quickly. And then I was taking any swim coaching job I could get. I taught a, a summer league team where half the kids didn't even know what jammers were. You know, we were, we were all the way at that beginner level. And then all the way up to working with kids that were breaking national age group records on the club side, you know, at 11 and 12 years old. So I got a lot of experience with that, then went back and worked as a volunteer assistant um, at CSUB. And the coach at the time, he had been a grad assistant with David. And that was when David was making the move to Charlotte. He said, hey, you know, you've been doing great stuff with our collegiate team. And that coach saw the difference in the swimmers. So he made a simple introduction. And honestly, Stephen, it was more like, yeah, I had to show him. I knew what I was doing. He had a, a reference that he trusted. And then, I mean, the results spoke for themselves. And I really appreciate everybody in that group. You know, Cullen, Mark Gangloff now, head coach at UNC, like, a lot of those guys, we were almost the same age and I had no level or experience in terms of reaching that kind of level of myself as a swimmer. But what I did have is the skill set knowledge about strength and conditioning. And I could see what the elite swimming level took. And then I figured out how do we, how do we marry these together? How do we complement it? And David was a great coach to work with because again, earlier than almost anybody else, he was talking about the need for athleticism in swimming. And that in large part fueled a lot of their Auburn runs in the early 2000s where his sprinters were, you know, breaking times that no one else had even approached. And a lot of it was due to the strength training that PK was doing there at Auburn and just the overall emphasis of athleticism and dryland as a part of the overall program. Yeah. What I really like about that is, and I've always appreciated this, um, you know, we always or listen to TV, listen to, uh, uh, reading articles, they always say the drive of Olympic champion, you know, these people really put it in. And I go, wait a second, I could go to any competitive team and you might have an Olympian in the animal lane or lane one, but the kids that are behind him, the kids that are in lane two, lane three, lane four, lane five, they're doing just as hard work. They're putting in just the amount of yardage. Their, their heart rate is probably even higher. They were just perhaps not gifted the DNA of that one particular athlete. So I really like that. I really appreciate, you know, uh, people like you who, who, yeah, you didn't make the Olympics, but it didn't matter because you were putting in the yards, the commitment, the thirst for knowledge that the Olympians have. And, and I'm glad that you and Dave Marsh, you know, were able to see eye to eye and then, you know, launch of where you're going. Well, and even on that note, Stephen, you know, going back to the team elite, we averaged about, you know, a dozen swimmers throughout that Olympic year. Some would come and go and, and whatnot. But two in particular that I remember were uh, two former graduates of the Air Force Academy. And I mean, they had barely made the Olympic trial cut. Like we're talking hundreds, but they were some of the best overall leaders of that group and the work ethic. So if you're a coach and you're looking at the team, I mean, the, the slower, the weaker swimmers, they can really actually provide the structure of what is this work ethic like? And especially coming from their, their military background at the academy, you talk about discipline and like doing everything to the 10th degree. So that was a really interesting thing to see in terms of we have our, our swimmers that already have, you know, their six figure deals with Speedo and all that. But then we also have guys that are eating top ramen that barely made their Olympic cut, you know, by a hundredth of a second, but they're also driving the group as well. Well, so yeah, it's an interesting dynamic when you put it all together. Yeah, uh, this is a little bit off topic for dryland, but it actually is very pertinent for the open water swimming community. And I, I heard uh, Coach Dave Marsh talk about his alpha swimmers, the, the swimmers that you know really that if you if you look at think about of a a pack of dogs and you had that one dog in the lead lead pack that was who he was looking for. Do you have any insight on on you know the team dynamics that uh, coach Mars put together? Uh, well, well, back then there was, it was almost a rotating thing on a daily basis. Like there was obviously Cullen and Mark who made the Olympic team uh, for the U S Margaret Holzer worked with us for a lot of that year as well. And then Jeremy Knowles from the Bahamas making the 200 fly. And so there, there was a lot of things. And then the other cool thing was throughout that Olympic year, we had a lot of visitors, uh, especially foreign athletes that would come in for a training camp a couple of weeks. And so there was an interesting always flow. And 
from my perspective, having to always adapt, like talk about keeping me on my toes, you know, workout locations are changing. So-and-so is changing. They're doing this. So that really allowed me to figure out a system that allows coaches to do what they see best in terms of the overall thing, right? Because again, I'm not trying to turn them into Olympic weightlifters. Fast swimming is the end goal. And so if the coach sees, hey, we need to do more kicking today, or we need to do X type of set, how does that then affect dry land? And how do we then alter it so that swimming is always taking the priority? And so that, that I really learned a lot in terms of that year, figuring out how do we change stuff, but still make sure we're increasing strength, we're increasing mobility and being specific to what each athlete needs. Got it. Got it. Now, you know, we all watch uh, the Olympics and, and you've got these just gorgeous swimmers with beautiful bodies. I mean, they're just so, so well proportioned and, you know, talk about six packs or eight packs and, you know, narrow waist and broad shoulders and just toned muscle. Um, they look good, you know, physically. They, they look like the stereotypical Olympic athlete. Now, is that a result of specific body sculpturing or is that just the, the function of the sport of swimming in addition to your dry land training? I mean, you know, yes, you don't want them to turn into Olympic bodybuilders, but their bodies are so well proportioned, so, uh, so well toned. You know, I'm like, how did they do that? That's, that's a really insightful question, Stephen. I'm glad you asked it that way. So in the course, we talk about building a swimmer's body. And I say there are three main things that you need to think about when you're building a swimmer's body. Number one, a high strength to body mass ratio. So you think about pull-ups are like the king example of that. If you are, you know, weigh X number of pounds and can then do it. Oh, guys, are you still hearing me? All right. I got signed out real fast. No, no, we're okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so when you're thinking about building a swimmer's body, having a high strength to body mass ratio. So pull-ups being the prime example of that. So if you can do a lot of pull-ups, uh, that's a great indicator that we have that box checked. The second one, a strong core, because if you think about a rubber raft and a kayak, which one cuts through the water better? We want to be the kayak, right? We don't want to be soft in the middle. And then the third one is being mobile, especially around the shoulders and the front part of your body. You could think of thoracic spine included as that as well. And so that's always front and center when I'm thinking about programming. Now, how that plays out then is we think about balancing ratios. So we talked about categories of exercises. There's push and pull for upper body, squat and hinge for lower body. So you always want to make sure those ratios are even one-to-one, -one, or if anything, a little bit more hinging than squatting and a little bit more pulling than pushing. Just thinking about that in programming, Stephen, ends up with the result that you see a lot and having that bigger picture of those three things that build a swimmer's body. And then the last thing I'd say, very specific to the programming is we, we talk about clean dry land training. And so what that means is I don't want to get a lot of extra waste products in terms of uh, lactate, any acidosis, anything extra. I don't want to do that on land because all I'm doing is junking up your system and making it longer for you to recover. And that then affects your swimming. So I want to keep reps lower. I don't really want to go beyond 30 seconds in almost anything I'm doing on land because it's not providing the true benefit that you get from on land training. And it's just delaying your recovery where then when you get back in the water, you're still feeling the effects of dry land. So it's a combination of all those things. But to your question, yes, there is a way if you know how to approach it. Man, I wish I had you as my strength coach because <laughs> I mean, I can't tell you the number of times we had to hit the weight room, you know, for an hour and then go into the pool. And I'm like, you know, it, I was always balancing. Well, I know today is going to be an IM workout. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to be, it's the workout's going to be tough, but now they're asking me to do, you know, whatever leg lit, uh, you know, uh, 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 bench press and this, that, and the other. And I'd always lay off personally. I'd always lay off maximizing the dry land because we had a swim workout right after. I mean, I, every single coach I had took us from the weight room directly to the pool. And I mean, I don't know how these other guys do it, but you know, 
So it makes sense. A couple of thoughts on that, Stephen, if I could jump in. So number one, in the course, we talk about when you're planning it. And that's a big question I get. When do we do dry land? Before or after? And I say, whatever goes first decides. And whatever goes first gets the priority. So if you're stuck, if there's no way you can change schedule and you can only do dry land first, then you need to realize that on the back end with swimming and realize that's not the day I'm doing my main test set. That's not the day I'm going to be doing a big kicking set if I'm looking for performance. So whatever goes first is always getting the priority. And an hour in the weight room can look a lot of different ways too, in terms of how you actually program that in the weight room. So just coaches thinking about that and understanding something has to give at this point, right? I can't go hundred percent in the weight room and then 110% in the water right after. It's just not possible. And so just thinking about that, and that's where the weekly plan comes back into play, Stephen, where you have the season plan and then you think you know what you're doing in the day, but the weekly plan just gives you a little bit of zoom out to say, okay, in a week, where are the main sessions that I'm trying to get? Like if I can only do this training, right? I only have three training options the whole week. Where am I placing them and what am I doing there? And that's the first step when we talk about doing your weekly plan. And, you know, it doesn't matter to me. Are they water or are they dry land? It depends. What are, where are you at in the season, right? If you're off season, it's probably dry land. If you're a few weeks away from your big meet, it's probably in the water. And so just making that determination then lets you fill in the rest of the puzzle. And then you could say, okay, these three are in. What's the next three highest priorities? And then you start to piece the puzzle together. When you do that, then when you get to writing the actual day's workout, not only is it so much easier, but it's going to be so much more effective because you've already done just a few minutes of prep work and understanding where are my priorities here? Athletes only have a limited amount of energy. They're not the energizer bunny. They do run out of energy, right? They do need recovery. And so you need to plan accordingly and pick out where do I really want to hit it? Yeah, oh, that's great. Um, and then the other thing that always, you know, I know in my own uh, limited experiences, if I did a swim workout, I, I preferred butterfly, I preferred um, I, uh, distance freestyle. I didn't like to do breaststroke. You know, I didn't like to do some kicking sets. And in the weight room, similarly, you know, bench press was okay, but I hated hamstring curls. You know, <laughs> there, there were exercises I'd like to do, exercises I didn't like to do. And inevitably, the exercise I didn't do, I didn't like to do, was my were my weak things. It's sort right. of like if my mom said, "Hey, you know, here's a meal, and there's broccoli and Brussels sprouts <laughs> and cauliflower. They're really good for you, but you can have your dessert, your chocolate cake and ice cream." Of course, I'm always going to eat the chocolate cake and ice cream. Of course, I'm going to avoid my hamstring uh, 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 curls or something. And so, how do you get? that sort of natural inclination to do things that we're good at or do things that we like and, and either force us or convince us that, hey, Steve, you're, you, you gotta build up your hamstrings. Are you a little weak on uh, this, that, and the other? And how do, you, how do you motivate athletes to do the things they need mm. and lay off overdoing the things they like? Well, I think the one, the easiest thing is to have a coach right? Because then it takes you out of it, right? It removes you a little bit from that bias. So I would say that's number one. And I would say coaches for anything, right? Whether it's swimming, dry land, outside stuff, always having an outside perspective, someone that's removed emotionally from the decision helps. So that's number one. Number two, then if you're understanding, and even like Stephen, you've talked about the conversation we've had so far of kind of light bulb moments here about how dry land, if you just have a few of those, the athletes start to get it. And yeah, they may not enjoy, you know, all right, now we got to do bridges because our core is weak. We haven't passed the, the core test. So we need to keep working on that. Well, if they do that, even just a little bit, they're going to start to see the results in the water. And then they're going to come back even more motivated and say, Hey, I see that I'm actually holding my streamline a little bit better off the wall. Going back to and uh, the coach I mentioned earlier that works at the age groupers in Texas. So with COVID, you know, talk about just a crazy year they had. They were in the pool, out of the pool. In the, it was just like two weeks on, two weeks off. And it was getting really frustrating. And after she went through most of the curriculum for the SSDC, she was implementing this on Zoom and the kids were just really working on their core, getting stronger. Out of the water for three weeks, they come back. 
the kids looked better than they ever had before. And she's like, what's going on? Obviously they're holding their line better. And when you think about 12 and unders, I mean, what's more important than streamlining at this point, right? If the kids can streamline off the water, like that's what you need to do as, a, as an age group coach, right? To prepare them for future success and going forward. And so when people start to see, oh, hey, I'm, I'm doing this a lot better in the pool and they see the connection on land, that motivates them a little bit more. I think it's deflating when you're just having to do something you don't like and you're not seeing the payoff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just know just, uh, you know, we've talked a little over a, a half an hour and I'm just so impressed because even now I, I, I go to, uh, you know, universities, which, you know, in the United States would arguably be have the highest level of, of dry land training experts, if you will. Yet there's very few from what I've seen true knowledge on the swimming side or water polo or diving amongst the collegiate athletic programs. Yeah, they have been assigned the swimmers, they've been assigned the water polo players, but they're really not understanding the mechanics of, of pulling or kicking or whatever. And, and I, I just see a huge need for you who came from the industry, was a swimmer, and, and is, you know, you grew up obviously as a as a age group, high school and collegiate swimmer. So you've seen all the aspects and, uh, you know, um, I think it's wonderful and sort of, sort of give it a little bit of an introduction to your program. If, you know, I want, hey, I'm motivated to buy your, <laughs> I'm motivated to register and buy now. So you know, <laughs> if we had a one-on-one -on -one session for two or three minutes, what would you tell me? Like, if I wasn't so willing to buy, how would you convince me to do so? Well, A, look at our results. I don't think anybody has been doing this as long as us, nor has gotten the results. Like at this point now, Stephen, we've worked with well over a thousand athletes all over the world, logging over 20,000 workouts that myself and our other dryland certified coaches have written following the principles. So, I mean, that just speaks in and of itself. The other thing, I think that a, a core component we try to operate around on is making it as simple as possible, but still being effective. I'm, I'm not really interested in trying to impress you with a lot of big words or, or high scientific theory. Like if, if you had a big background in periodization, we could talk and we could go down the rabbit hole. But at the end of the day, I don't know if that serves 90% of the coaches and swimmers out there, right? That's just more intellectual stimulation. And we feel like, okay, we talked about something, but if you're a swim coach that doesn't have that background, what did you learn from that? And how are you going to apply it? So I always kept thinking about, I'm talking to someone that doesn't have the background I have, but they want to get the results I've gotten. And being able to walk through, whether it's our certification or working one-on-one -on -one with one of our dryland certified coaches, if you're a coach and you want your team dryland program for us or individual. And honestly, we've had a combination now where coaches are getting surge strength trial and certified, and then still having us continue to work with their team because now we're able to talk on a different level. If now the coach understands the periodization, the movement categories, the planning, they're going to have a better thought process in what they're doing in the water. And then we can have a higher level conversation about what we're doing on land. You know, we're, we're not magicians here, Stephen, or else I would charge a lot more. But, you know, one quick story, we had a swim coach one time that wanted us, uh, you know, they paid money for us to work with their team. And part of the onboarding process, we asked the coach in the first meeting with when they meet our dryland certified coach, all right, coach, what's your season plan? What's your weekly template, you know, look like, what are you doing, you know, Monday mornings, all that stuff. They didn't have it. So how are we supposed to create a dryland program around no plan? I, I can tell you, it didn't work for very long. And at some point we finally just got rid of the team because it wasn't worth the hassle because that coach hadn't even taken the effort to plan out what they're doing in the water. And so again, we're not working with magic here, but if you go through the steps, you go through the process that we've created through the certification or when you're working with uh, one of our coaches for a team or individual setting, we'll see results because we follow the process. It's a repeatable thing. And yes, your situation may be a little bit different than yours. Maybe we have to tweak this variable, but it's not like we're in the upside down world where just everything is different, right? There's just little things we have to fine tune. Yeah, that's, that's great. The, the other way I think you actually really got me hooked is when you refer to swimmers as athletes. Mm. 
you know, and I, you know, when I, when, at least in the United States, when we talk about an athlete, oh, that guy's a great athlete. You know, it's somebody who can dunk the ball. It's somebody who could throw a touchdown pass. It's, it's a soccer player who could, you know, weave in between defenders and, and make this beautiful kick. I mean, though, in our mind, or at least my mind and many Americans mind, that's an athlete. Yet we never refer, at least we rarely refer to athletes, uh, swimmers as athletes. And when you said athletes, I'm like, whoa, somebody just gave me a compliment, a compliment that in my mind elevated me as a swimmer to some level of, of uh, athletic uh, competency. And I really appreciate that you, you, know, you view swimmers as athletes. Well, it's, it's undeniable now, Stephen. I mean, 20 years ago, right? I think that's probably the last Olympics we could look at in 2000, where if you looked behind the blocks at every finals, it could kind of be a toss up. All right. Do they look very athletic? Oh, they definitely look like a swimmer, a swimmer. You know, that person looks athletic. It, it was few and far between. I think that was probably the last Olympics you could say that on a whole, and especially this upcoming one. Are you kidding me? I mean, you, you, whether it's guys, girls, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the event now either. I mean, Katie Ledecky, a lot of her success, you talk about a distance dominator, she does dry land at the same level and making sure she's not just doing everything in the water, but there are things on land that are critical. You know, you think about something as iconic as like Janet Evans 800 world record that stood for what, 20 plus years. And now she has just obliterated that and taken it to another level. It's not because she's swimming, you know, 30 hours a week. It's also because she's figured out how to pair what she's doing on land in the water. So I think that the more coaches can understand how important and integral a quality dryland program can be, I think about it as an exponential factor. If you can get it right, whatever you're doing in the water, and I don't care what program you're doing, right? High volume, low volume, it doesn't matter to me. Whatever you're doing, we can increase those results because if your swimmers are in the water more consistently, if you don't have to take time off of injury and you have more mobility, more strength to hang on on the back end, especially, you're just going to get better results out of whatever program you're doing in the water. That's great. Man, can, I, I, can I jump um, in with a question, Stephen? So a lot of the people I know and swim with, we're training for a 1K, a 2K, usually midsummer, And there's usually one, one event that we have in mind. Um, and for me right now, it's a uh, Trans Tahoe Relay. I'm going to do a 2K. And then about three hours later, I do a 1K. And it's it's like Christmas for open water swimming. It's is this in day. Lake Tahoe? In Lake Tahoe, yeah. That's awesome. It's, it's <laughs> That's a awesome. wonderful, yeah. And it's it's hosted by the by the Olympic Club uh, where, oh, yeah. where I swim, and it's just a it's a wonderful swimming reunion. People fly in from all over the country. We'll see we'll see what it's like this year, but they're definitely hosting it, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm on the hook to get in shape. I'm behind, as usual. I have three months, Chris. Um, and I'm getting in the water. I can get in the water about three, four times a week. And I've been supplementing with, I do some, do some core, I'll do some push-ups, I'll do some uh, pull-ups. Um, and then I, I stretch before bed. But I, I'm just pulling this from, you know, things I have learned um, very haphazardly. How do, I, how do I rein that in over the next three months? Um, and how do I take advantage of your course to swim faster at the Trans Tahoe Relay? So I think consistency is the number one key and frequency, right? It's, it's one in the, the same there. And so three times a week is the sweet spot. I tell for most swimmers, you don't tell me anything about your training background, three times a week, we're talking in the gym, some kind of external resistance implements. If you tell me you don't have resources for that, I'm gonna tell you it's, it's really hard. Again, I'm not a magician. If you tell me you have no equipment, we can still do a program, but it's going to be limited because you either chose or are not going to make the investment to have a few more tools that we can then expand your program even more. So I have, I have two 10 pound weights, one 50 pound weight and a, uh, a, a ball I do sit-ups on. Do you have anything to do pull-ups on? I, I do a park. Okay. Yeah. So that's good, Quinn. We, 
Yeah, that, that's enough. Okay. Pull-up bar, and we, we talk about this in the equipment module, like what's the bare minimum? Pull-up bar, something weighted, and then the other thing I would say is uh, some type of band, whether it's a mini band or super band, that just allows us to do a good chunk of programming. So even just as simple as those three things, and then I would rank in order of priority, making sure you're doing pull-ups. Again, not high volume necessarily. So for you being a guy, if you're in the 15 range and you can do 15 for three sets in a row, not like back to back to back, but over the course of like an hour, then we start to go weighted at that point. But if you can't, that's what we're going to work up to. And again, going back to uh, the, the female example I talked about, with pull-ups in particular, the frequency really matters. So if you can add in on top of the three times you're doing, you know, 45 minutes, an hour of dryland workout, if all the other days too, you can just squeak in, all right, I'm just going to do three or four reps, you know, three or four reps here, three or four reps here. Just greasing that groove really helps with the pull-up strength in particular. Um, with that, I would also think of core. So we are, our bridge core test is basically, can you hold a bridge? So plank, we call on your hands, bridge on forearms. The bridge test is a two and a half minute test. If you fail that, your core is poor. It's not, it's like, it, it needs to be seriously addressed. And so that's one minute bridge, then go right into 15 seconds with one foot up for about three inches, then the other foot for, fi for 15 seconds, hand for 15, other hand for 15. We're at two minutes now. The last 30 seconds, you're splitting by one arm opposite leg up. So now you only have two points of contact, arm opposite leg up. Now we're at two and a half minutes. So that's a test anybody can do. And if you can't pass that, you're poor. We need to work on it. If you do, then I say, okay, we now have free range to do whatever exercises fit best into the programming. So that's the line in the sand. I would say you can quickly test what is your core strength. But if I had to isolate it, pull-ups, core strength, because we go back to how do you build a swimmer's body, right? And the third thing I would say is for the shoulder mobility, if you could stick a hand behind and then a hand over top, if you can be without uh, about one and a half uh, your hand length, so from the palm of your hand to your finger, one to one and a half uh, away from your fists, that's pretty good mobility. If you're farther than that, we really need to work on that, um, especially if both sides are that far off. That's great. That's super helpful. Thank you, Chris. One, one question on the pull-ups. You seem to emphasize pull-ups a lot. And I've, I've heard that it translates very well to, to swimming and a lot of open water swimmers are obviously doing freestyle. Um, you know, it's not a perfect replicate. So, I mean, can you talk a little bit about the muscle groups that it engages and, and how it translates to swimming? Yes. Yeah, so this is Quinn, something I talk about in the course where don't get confused by what it looks like. So that's where people go down the rabbit hole. They're like, I want to mimic swimming and make it look like swimming. Well, that's either going to water down something we're doing on land, or if you're in the water and you're trying to do something that betters off on land, it's not going to have the intended effect. So I talk about it as the fish out of the water syndrome. Like if you're in the water, think about what you're doing in the water. If you're on land, don't try to make it look like swimming to be swimming specific. Swimming specific goes back to when I talked to Stephen about the three points of how do we build your body. And so if you can think, am I doing one of those three goals, more mobility, core strength, uh, strength to body weight and mass ratio. If I'm hitting one of those boxes, my programming is in the right direction. I'm building that swimmer's body. And so you think about the lat in particular, which is the prime mover in a pull-up or chin-up. And again, people want to split the differences. It's just hand grip. It's not a big deal, right? And it doesn't matter if you go wide, narrow, whatever. You can do many things in the programming. And those are levers, little variables that we can adjust as we need to throughout the program. But the lat is such a big muscle and a, a prime mover in the pull-up that if you think about, especially I go back again, distance swimmers, I think gain more out of strength training and dryland training than even sprinters because you're in the water that much longer. So Quinn, how, how long is one of your swims going to take here in Tahoe? They actually do it by time. So it's a 30 minute swim and then um, you rotate through on a relay of six and then uh, about two and a half, three hours later, a 10 minute swim. So think about this. If you, right now, let's say pre-training, right? If you swimming for 30 minutes, 
you have to be at, let's just say 70% of your max in just terms of effort, what your muscles can handle. Okay. That that's where you're at. And if you go much more than that, you're probably going to flame out pretty early. And if you go much lower, you're going to be slower than what you could be. Well, if we add more strength in your pull-ups, think about, we've just increased the ceiling to now, instead of at 70%, that same effort for you, that same speed, that same time, and now maybe 65, 60%. So now we've given you a higher ceiling of capacity, easy speed on the front end. And yes, your distance, your race is 30 minutes. So the front end is now 15 minutes, right? 15, 20 minutes. But that allows you to swim at a higher rate because you have a greater amount of capacity. The other thing, the, the thing that no one talks about that distance swimmers gain so much is metabolically muscle fiber. So there are subtypes. There are Type one, type two fibers, type two are the more twitchy, type one are the more slower. But within those, there are subtypes. Now you can't make muscle two, type two go into muscle one, type one fibers. But within the subtypes of type two, you can change that with training. The best thing for distance swimmers, especially when you start strength training, the muscle fibers will switch subtypes. And the, the way it goes along the spectrum and this is crazy to think about, but strength training increases the muscle's ability to metabolically produce energy, especially at a longer level. So there's less acidosis, there's more greater efficiency use of muscle oxygen, and you cannot do that any other way. So you go running, that's not going to help it the same way strength training would. And so that's why I think it's really the secret weapon for distance swimmers. The longer the event, the better and the more you're missing out if you don't do dryland training. Wow, that's great. You sold me. <laughs> so, so Quinn, I uh, when my son was uh, a high school student, I bought him a pull-up bar because he wanted one. Um, and then right that next month, his high school started a weight training program. So the pull-up bar went completely unused. And I had just bought the uh, pull-up bar. So I actually started doing pull-ups. And there is a direct, as Chris said, there is a direct correlation between the amount of pull-ups that I did and the speed that I was going. A direct correlation. And, and that was what, that was at the age of 54, 55 that I started. I hadn't done a pull-up. I had not done one pull-up since my senior year in college. So between 21 and 54, <laughs> Five, I did zero pull-ups. I started use, doing pull-ups because I just bought an unused a, a, a pull-up bar that was going unused, and it was a direct correlation. All, and, I mean, and you're feeling that that power on the front end of the catch, or are there specific places where you you felt more powerful? I I felt, to be honest, um, it was it was a grip, and it was not just raw strength, but also really interesting. Again, I, I did no sit-ups, I did no uh, crunches, I did no planks. Just pulling myself up and holding my body, you know, steady, my core was getting stronger. I mean, it was, you know, other than, other than my ankles, I thought the pull-up, and so I've been, I didn't know this, what Chris was talking about, but just my own personal experience, there is a direct relationship between pull-ups. The only dry land training thing that I did it started in age of 54 and it was a total body changer. That's great. Steven, can so, I jump on that real fast? I'll explain you. in three different ways why that was so impactful for you. So number one, grip strength is directly related to overall strength. So your body is always trying to think, how do I preserve? So if you think about this very simply, if there's a 200 pound suitcase that you're going to pick up, and you can't pick up 200 pounds, your muscles can't stabilize it, why in the world is your body gonna allow you to grip that to let that your shoulder be pulled out of its socket because you can't hold that? So the grip strength is in very strongly correlated to overall strength. And so you're right, you probably felt your grip getting stronger because you were in fact getting stronger. And we talk about the pull-ups being kind of the king of body mass to strength ratio. So there's that. The second thing, is core is strongly related to the pull category. So, and it's also strongly related to the push category. So both upper body categories, if you have a weak core, you're gonna be weak in both those areas. It doesn't matter, you know, what you can do. So that's why 
if I can only do three tests with someone, I'm going to do how many pull-ups can you do bridge test? And then I just want to see you squat, you know, with your arms up to just see how that looks. And off of that, I'm going to be able to tell really well where you are in all of the athletic areas that we're going to program. The last thing, Stephen, is with your age in particular. So at some point, you know, 40s, 50s, naturally you're going to be losing body mass unless you actively fight it. And so for the longest time in school, I was just hammered. You know, you can't gain, gain strength when you're older. You can't gain strength when you're older. This is all the textbook said. Then I work with master swimmers, in their 60s and 70s, and we would get them so much stronger in a year or two. I mean, it would take a while, but we kept going at it. And one particular example, a guy that ended up being world champion uh, masters in, I forget which category is, and he was 50 plus, um, but he had come off surgery, wasn't sure if he was going to swim again. Two years later, he's deadlifting 350 pounds, doing pull-ups with 50 pounds around his waist. And he wasn't sure who's was going to swim two years ago because he was in such bad shape. Like that's what we're able to do. And then you think about how much more that's going to help you recover, especially as you age. It, it's going to happen, but you need to fight it and resist it by adding strength training into your routine. Yeah. And Quinn, the other thing that I found is, you know, again, when I first got on there, you know, I did one and I was like, oh, I was just the next day I was sore. I did one pull up the first day after what, 20, 33 years of doing nothing. And then the next day I said, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do one again, even though I was sore, but was really incredible from one to five improvement was hard. And then improving from five to 10 was shorter from 10 to 15 was shorter. It was like I was building muscle upon muscle. And I think that makes complete sense. Cause if I'm out of shape and I try to go hunt, like, let's say hundreds on one twenty. I'm like out of breath, but gradually you build up that base and suddenly, God, 115 is becoming easier. 110 becomes easier. Whereas two months ago, it was really hard. And I, and I was like, I never thought that you could build upon muscle until my, you know, obviously I didn't know Chris at that point and I should have, but um, like everything that Chris is saying to me, A, makes sense. B, I've experienced myself and, and C, very importantly, like, I want to take this course because <laughs> so, so there's a body me, of knowledge there that I need to jump into. Yeah. Stephen, real quick, Quinn, real quick. So with the pull-ups, and here's the, the thing. Most people can't do any, or they're at the bottom of the scale, right? Stephen, zero, one, maybe two. And so they're like, I'm not going to mess with it, right? It's, it's either yes or no. And so they just avoid it. That's one of the big things that we talk through in the certification is we say, how do you build a pull-up? And there's lots of different steps. I have yet to meet someone that I've gotten to do five, 10 pull-ups if you give me enough time. You know, and I said it a year ago when the shutdown happened, I said, I don't know how long this is gonna last, but if you were following the training program that we put out for free when we were doing the free webinars about a year ago, in three to six months, I absolutely guarantee you are doing five to 10 pull-ups no matter where you were at. And so then it's just on people. Are they going to do it or not, right? Are they going to get the equipment needed to stair step their way up to? And then you feel that momentum. Like you said, Stephen, once you get to five, 10, 15, now you're really rolling. It's the starting point that's so hard and knowing how do I scale to my level? Great. And, and Chris, that actually brings up later this week, we are going to post uh, a couple free preview courses that you very graciously built for, for our audience. We have a, a learning center uh, on our website now, openwaterswimming.com, and we have our open water coaches certification. We have some workouts you can download, and coaches are continuing to add courses. And why don't you tell us a little bit about those two preview courses, one on core and one on pull-up. Yes, yeah, so the core training one and building your pull-up, those are both taken from the Surge Strength Academy. So that's what we just built in the last year. And that's where the Surge Strength Drown Certification is in. But also in the academy, we've built out a lot of 
a free Dryland 101 courses. So basically a lot of the conversation we've had is gonna be covered in those courses. How do you do your first pull-up? How do you do core training? How do I write a Dryland workout if I've never done it? We take you through some of those steps and all of those are free. And they're just kind of little lessons here and there that we've pulled directly from the certification curriculum. So if you enjoy the 101s, you're gonna love the the certification because it's at this point over 200 lessons, almost 23 hours of content. Uh, and most of the lessons are five to 10 minutes. So you can kind of pick your way through it. And, but yeah, so I, I thought that if I'm going to start somewhere, especially with your audience, being able to do a pull up and being able to hold that bridge for two and a half minutes to pass that core test, that would be the two things I'd want your audience to do. So yeah, they're, they're free now uh, with the Woza site. That's great. Great. Well, thank you very much, Chris. This has been really educational, but more importantly, it's been inspirational. So, um, you know, can't get any better than that. Thank you very much for your time. I'm going to go do Steven, some pull-ups right now, Chris. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care, Appreciate guys. It. Bye.